follow this YouTube channel right now. All of my friends, all of my subscribers, if you want to stay tuned to what's happening on the continent and right here in the heartbeat of Africa, which is Ghana, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you very much for checking us out. I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Come follow me to a secret place where only the moon. And when the Lomé Convention had died its death, they came up with another one in 2000 and 2000 called the Cotonou Convention. This belt, Lomé Cotonou, appears to be a very favored site for signing these treaties. <laughs> they signed yet another one in Cotonou to take over from the Lomé Convention. Once again, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific, is it in their best interest that we should do well? And there is an old English saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And for whose benefit is the tune called? And they did not stop there. Everybody somehow is always interested in Africa and her welfare. How many of you here will not remember uh, the structural adjustment programs in the 1980s? How many of you here will not remember the Millennium Development Goals? There were eight when they came about, now they have been renamed, now they are Sustainable Development Goals and there are 34 of them. How many of you here will not remember Africa Growth Opportunity Act? The House, the Parliament of the United States of America sitting at the Capitol Hill in the United States of America saying we open the space for African countries and what are they opening space for? Textile. We will now, whether it is in Lesotho, whether it is in Nigeria or Nairobi, Kenya, our women and our young men are suing jeans and other apparels which are taken to supermarkets in the United States of America. And once they have worn them and they are tired of them, they created another export opportunity of second-hand clothing. <laughs> and second-hand clothing, that is why the textile industries in Kaduna in Nigeria died. That is why textile companies in Kenya, whether it was in whether it was Rivertex, whether it was Kikomi, whether it was Mountex, they all died because Europe was now telling us what we have consumed and rejected, you Africans must now consume. And when recently the Rwandese and the Ugandans said that we were going to stop the importation of second-hand clothing, they threatened us with sanction. Africa is meant to treat us new, which that which Europe and America has rejected. That is the Africa that you want me to talk about. So when we talk about this continent of Africa, there have been no shortage of attempts to help her and for her to help herself. I remember on the sixth day of March, 1997, in Accra, Ghana, the former president of Tanzania, Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, speaking under the theme, the unity of Africa, said, among other things, that we have not come here to remind ourselves how important unity is. We know that African unity is significant. And he said, if Africa is to be a great continent and if Africa is to realize our potential, Africans must de-emphasize their Tanzanianness. Africans must de-emphasize their Ghanaianness and they must emphasize their Africanness. And he went on to say, I'm not naive in appreciating that we have long been in our little corners, but I'm telling us that out there in the world, they only know us as Africans. And he reminded the audience that there are times when he has gone to Europe and his own colleagues in the leadership in certain parts of the world will ask him, what is happening in Senegal? while he himself is the president of Tanzania. <laughs> so that is the Africa that we are talking about. 
So there have been many initiatives to make Africa great. How many of us will forget the new initiative for African development under NEPAD, signed in the year 2001 in Lusaka, Zambia, when Africans took the view once again that in order to grow, we must work together. There have been no shortage of initiatives to bring Africa together. And I remember in the very early days, in the 1960s and in the 1970s, the grand project as conceived by Kwame Nkrumah, having failed to take off as it was designed to take off, many African countries took the view that the only way in which we could ultimately have the grand African agenda was to come up with regional developments. So we came up with the East African community and indeed I can remember so very vividly because even in Africa there were days when Africa worked in the early days. In the early days many African countries were recording economic growth of anything between 6 and 7 percent. In the early days after independence there were areas where Africa was growing in education. In the health, the indices had improved so that infant mortality and maternal mortality indices were positive. We could see that in agriculture, Africa was beginning to feed herself. Africa was adding value to her things. I remember in Nairobi, in public schools, young school children would receive textbooks and exercise books. I remember that classes had libraries I remember that in those early days the public transport systems worked. I remember in those days that our agricultural products were receiving the kind of prices that they ought to receive in the world market. I remember in those early days in countries such as Zambia, the culture was strong because the copper was being paid for rightly. I remember in those early days in countries such as this one where cocoa and in the neighboring Cote d'Ivoire when cocoa was being transported and you are receiving the right price. I remember in those early days diamond from Wadui in Shinyanga and diamond from Botswana and in Namibia were receiving the right price. There was a time in those early days when Africa was indeed moving in some direction. And I remember in East Africa when we had one common currency, when we had one airline, when we had one university and things were moving. In the education sector, I remember students coming from Kenya and traveling to Fura Bay in Freetown. I remember hearing universities such as the University of Education at Winneba. I remember the University of Legon. I remember the University of Nigeria at Nsuka. I remember the University of Maiduguri. And I remember the University of Makerere in Uganda and Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and many other universities. Africa was rising, but something happened. Something happened. Something happened. There are those who think that it was externally induced, they may be right. There are those who think that our leadership was also a contributory factor and I think they are right. So that there is a sense in which we Africans are also co-authors of our own misfortune. We are co-authors in the sense that there is and there have been opportunities to make us great. At the beginning of the address, the Vice Chancellor rightly remarked, the, or rather the, the Professor rightly remarked, that in Africa there were countries that were doing better than South Korea. Kenya was doing better than South Korea. Kenya had a higher GDP than China, Ghana, the same. Tanzania the same, then somehow the Koreans went and left us. The Chinese during our lifetime have left us. The Singaporeans have left us. The Malaysians have left us. The Brazilians have left us. The Vietnamese after the war, the war in 1975 have left us. Who is it? What is it that holds us back? What is it? 
Is it us? Is it some power? Are we children of a lesser God? What is it that holds us back? Why is it that Africa does not work? Why is it that I'm speaking to you now? Even what we call peace in many African countries is not peace, it's just silence. <laughs> I've lamented for too long. Now I want to talk about what it is that we can do. But before I do that, let us look at our continent, at this continent called Africa. Our combined GDP, the 54 officially recognized countries, that is assuming that you don't ask uh, the Moroccans about Sahrawi. <laughs> Our GDP last year combined, the 54 of us combined, all of us, 1.4 billion of us, our goods and services put together is no more than 2 trillion United States dollars, and I'm being generous about this. And to give you a perspective, the state of California in the United States of America with a population of slightly under 39 million has a GDP last year of three trillion United States dollars. To give you a perspective, and my good friend, the Honorable Minister from Burundi is here, their GDP last year was no more than 2.3 billion United States dollars. That is exactly the same amount that the state of New York in New York collects in one day. In one day. That is the continent that we are talking about, my mother Africa. How are we going to make her work? I want you to look at her. Look at her in the Gambia. What does she produce? Groundnuts. That is assuming that the Chinese will not come up with plastic groundnuts soon. <laughs> and I'm saying this to tell us we are relying on goods which can be taken out of the market. And tourism. How many people visit the Gambia in the name of tourism? If they are more than one million, then we celebrate and we bring out dancers. Meanwhile, the bazaar market in Istanbul receives 99 million visitors every year. What tourism are we talking about? Let us go to Senegal. What is she producing? How can we make her work? What, how can we make Mauritania work? How can we make Mali work? How can we make Chad work when almost 70% of it has dried out in the last few decades? Then you wonder why we have Boko Haram, why there are recruits for Boko Haram and ISIS and Daesh. Go to Sudan and South Sudan, countries that are endowed with natural resources. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, a paradox and an irony at once, the richest country on earth in terms of natural resources. But who will allow Congo to be at ease? Who will allow her? Because in her state of confusion, she is a jungle from which you can hunt without consequence. So when one rebel group dies, another one is resuscitated. I know of no African country that makes weapons except South Africa. The others just make bullets. <laughs> 
The Kenyans will make bullets. The Ugandans will make bullets. But they have no gun to use them and they import the guns. And yet the conflicts that are alive and well in Africa are legion as the Central African Republic. They are conflicts which no longer are no longer covered in the newspapers or in the media of the forgotten conflicts of Africa. Burkina Faso. And yet the African Union says that by the year 2020, the guns will be silent in Africa. 2020 is 28 days away from today. The guns will not be silent. And I'm saying this because to make Africa work, the guns must be silent. Because if the guns are not silent, our farmers will not grow crops. If the guns are not silent, our women will not go to the markets. If the guns are not silent, our resources will not be channeled in the right direction. The guns must be silent. We want to make Africa work. Will she work? Can she work? Yes, she can. But what are the fundamentals that must make Africa work? Let me remind you, Africa remains attractive. Why is Africa so attractive? Throughout the ages, it has always been attractive. It was attractive to the Portuguese and the Spaniards, but I'm not going to say that. It was attractive to the Arabs, but I'm not going to say that. It was attractive to the Jews, but I will not say that. What I'm going to say that is attractive again, it is that so attractive that every two years the Japanese call our leaders to Japan. That is how attractive Africa is. <laughs> they call them to Japan in order to discuss how Japan is going to work with Africa for the benefit of Africa. I do not believe it. <laughs> It must be for the benefit of Japan. It is so attractive that the Chinese leaders call Africans to Beijing every year. The 54 of them, they call them to Beijing. And they say, this is how China is going to work for the benefit of Africa. I refuse to believe them. It must be that there is something that is being done for the benefit of Beijing. Because if I was Chinese, I would do that which is in my best interest, not in the best interest of Africans. It is so attractive that the Russians called our leaders only a few months ago in Sochi. And when they invite you, they invite you to the best places. It is so interesting. So that the Russians can work with Africa for the benefit of Africa. That is how attractive Africa is. It is so attractive that the Germans also invited our leaders to Berlin. It is so attractive that even the Arabs are inviting them to Doha. And it, that is how attractive it is. Have you ever heard the Latin Americans being invited? No, I did not hear. Have you ever heard the Arabs being invited? No. It is only Africans who are invited. That is how attractive Africa is. Is it a bad thing? Depending on what you think. We can use it to our own advantage or we can allow them to use it to their advantage. You know, when I look at Africa and I look at her in the continent, in the context of how attractive she is, another word, comes to my mind called globalization. When we talk about globalization, you talk about globalization as if it were a new world. It is not. Africans were once globalized as a commodity in the slave market. We were sold everywhere in the world. That was globalization. <laughs> that was globalization. Then we were globalized again through colonization. Then we were globalized again through neocolonization. 
Now we are being globalized in the context of opening our markets. 